talking about uh, redefining our boundaries. And I guess I realized I'd redefined my boundaries when this tweet went out to almost half a million people. The seahorse is the only fish with a neck and the only species on earth in which the males give birth via me, Helen Scales. <laughs> if only conservation was that easy. Um, it went out because I was on a radio show talking about a book I wrote about how well, I explain how male seahorses evolved to become pregnant. And what that message showed me was the incredible power of things like Twitter to send out messages to the world. And in my case, to inject a bit of ocean wonder into people's lives. Because for most people, most of the time, the oceans are out of sight and out of mind. I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time diving and researching in oceans around the world. I've seen beautiful, bizarre things, and I've also witnessed many of the problems the oceans face. I've felt the squeeze of a seahorse's tail, and I've seen hundreds of dead seahorses on sale as traditional Asian medicines. And there came a point where I decided that doing research for myself wasn't enough, and I wanted to start sharing these stories. And that's what I spend a lot of my time doing now. Essentially, I've become one of the latest in a long line of ocean storytellers. For millennia, people have pondered this alien realm filled with strange, scary creatures, and we've told stories to try and understand that. The only difference now is that there's never been a more vital time for people to hear these stories because human actions are ruining the oceans like never before. And the only way we're going to change that, I think, is if people know about and if they care for some of the things that live there. And what better place to start than have your mind spin with stories of real sea monsters? So today I'm going to tell you a few of my favorite stories that I think will change the way that you think about things that live in the sea. Well, my first story is about the time I was mistaken for a giant fish. <laughs> for my PhD, I studied Napoleon rats. Now, I spent a long time living on a tiny remote island in the South China Sea, and I was there to study an incredible natural spectacle, Napoleon rats having sex. Imagine the scene. <laughs> Once a month, when the moon is full, Dozens of these huge female Napoleon rats all gather in the same spot. They're about up to a meter long. And they go to the spot where a single flirtatious male is hanging out. And he's defending his territory from any other intruding males. He is enormous. He's six foot long and chunky. He wouldn't fit into a bathtub. And he basically, one by one, takes these females and he leads them off into the blue water away from the reef. They swim side by side until suddenly she swims upwards and releases a cloud of eggs into the water. He releases a cloud of sperm, and then he turns on his tail and goes right back to the reef to pick up another mate. Or he comes back to the reef to find me hanging around in his territory, and he charges right at me. <laughs> Luckily, I have a big underwater camera to hide behind, because what I'm doing is taking pictures of him and his mates. By analyzing hundreds of pictures, I showed for the first time that those beautiful, um, intricate patterns on the face of a Napoleon Rass are like fingerprints. They're unique to each individual. And that let me show that the females, in fact, return to that spawning site several times each month. And if they, if they live long enough, they'll come back in a very different role. After a decade, the females undergo a sex change. They turn from girls into boys. They grow this big bump on their heads and big, blue, big rubbery lips. And that's one of the reasons why, sadly, there are fewer of these fish in the oceans than there used to be. In China, Napoleon wrasse are a delicacy, especially those big lips. I wrote a paper in the journal Science about how fisheries are strip-mining the oceans for these fish. 
And a while later, I found out the really depressing news that all those fish I'd learned to identify in the South China Sea, each individual I'd learned to recognize from its face, had been caught and taken away to the restaurant trade. And I don't suppose any of those people eating those fish had any idea what extraordinary lives those fish had led. Well, for my next story, I want to tell you about crustaceans that live at the very bottom of the deepest part of the sea. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench is so deep that you could put Mount Everest, Ben Nevis, and two Eiffel Towers in it, and it still wouldn't quite reach the waves. Down at the bottom live things called amphipods. Here's an amphipod. Um, the ones in the Challenger Deep have enzymes inside their guts that break down cellulose. That's essentially molecules made by plants. Now, you might ask, well, why is a deep sea creature, why did it, oh, can you go back one actually? Can you go back another one? Thank you. That might have been me in the pocket. Um, why would they evolve and adapt to a vegetarian life when there are no plants growing at the bottom of the sea? It's too dark down there. Well, life in the deep is very chancy. There's so little food that it pays to be able to eat pretty much anything down there, including the occasional bit of driftwood that might make its way the 11 kilometers to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. Now, if you were to take one of those amphipods and bring it back up to the surface, and if it was to puke on a piece of paper, that paper would melt. And it's possible that we might be able to use those enzymes to make the next generation of biofuels. So it is possible that we could be driving around one day in cars powered by amphipod puke. And that does bring me on to my final story, which is about um, another amphipod. And this one has the rather unusual way of um, defending itself against predators. Now, it does this by kidnapping these animals, sea angels. And they do it because sea angels taste disgusting. Now, it sounds lovely, sea angel, doesn't it? But it sounds much nicer than sea slug. Um, but technically, that's what this is. They're a type of marine snail that have evolved life without a shell. They flit through the open ocean on tiny wings, and many of the species have evolved really noxious compounds that they load their tissues with, and predators have learned to avoid that. Now, these amphipods come along and take advantage of that because they basically grab hold of a sea angel, hold it on their heads, and use it like a personal bodyguard. It doesn't seem to hurt the sea angels, um, but it doesn't do them a lot of good either. For one thing, it makes it quite hard for them to hunt. Because don't be fooled by this angelic appearance. Sea angels are voracious predators. Now, here is a picture, which you've already seen, um, of a sea angel attacking its favorite food. Um, I'll go back again. <laughs> I shouldn't put it in my pocket, thanks. Um, they're attacking, this is a sea angel attacking its favorite food. This is called a sea butterfly. Now, sea butterflies look like um, a normal garden snail that you might find, one that sprouted wings and that's also swimming through the open ocean. And uh, you can see it with its curling shell right here. Now, the point is that soon it might not just be the amphipods making it difficult um, for these sea angels to find sea butterflies. Mountain carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is dissolving in the oceans, causing the pH to drop. Since the Industrial Revolution, the oceans have become 30% more acidic. And it's thought that soon the oceans could be so corrosive that these sea butterflies with their calcium carbonate shells could simply start melting away. And these aren't just food um, for sea angels. In fact, sea butterflies have been nicknamed the potato chips or the crisps of the ocean. There's a lot of animals that have these as their staple diet. So if we were to lose those sea angels, sorry, sorry sea butterflies, <laughs> this abundant snack in the ocean would mean that there's, if we lose them because of ocean acidification, there will be a lot of hungry mouths left to feed out there in the sea. So sea butterflies matter. Those are my three stories of the ocean. Um, but trust me, I have plenty more, because the stories of the sea will never run out. There will always be more things that we don't know about the oceans, and I find that really exciting. I want to leave you with this quote from movie director Werner Herzog, who said, what would an ocean be without a monster lurking in the dark? It would be like sleep without dreams. The oceans feed our stomachs, but they also feed our imaginations. And my call to you today is to listen out for these stories of the sea. 
Because even if you never get a chance to see a male seahorse give birth, or witness a giant fish orgy, or perhaps spot an amphipod abducting a sea angel, your world is a better place just knowing that these things are out there swimming through our seas. Thank you. <laughs>